In Bloodborne, you are a hunter working solo or cooperatively, venturing into the city of Yarnum to take down horrific monsters, discover hidden secrets, and figure out what's going on behind this growing infestation occurring in the city. Hi everyone, welcome back to yet another tutorial here on the Dice Tower. My name is Tim Chuan and I make board game cinematics. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to play the base game of Bloodborne. Now this tutorial is gonna be a little bit different because this is a campaign game with four unique chapters. So I'm gonna to try to show you as minimal spoilers as possible of the long hunt, just so you can have the best experience possible when playing the game on your own. So if I can tell you about it verbally, I'm going to, but if I have to show you different parts in order to kind of explain full details about what's going on, then I'm gonna do that as well. All right, so let's get started. So like I said, we're gonna start with the long hunt campaign. There are four different setups that you have to do, but they are really quick. So let's go ahead and start off first with the campaign setup. For each campaign, you want to grab that particular campaign's deck, which should already come shrink wrapped in its own set of cards. But this is what each deck is made out of. You'll need an introduction card. You'll need three chapter cards and mission cards organized in a numerical order. Make sure you do not shuffle these cards. Now moving on to the hunter setup. Now for the hunter setup, you wanna make sure you are set on the hunter that you pick because you're gonna stick with that hunter throughout the entire campaign. We'll be playing with the Saw Cleaver Hunter today, so you'll need the hunter's trick weapon dashboard, the matching firearm card, in this case it's the hunter's pistol, and of course the miniature, so here is the Saw Cleaver Hunter. And from there, each player is also going to take one hunter dashboard and its matching colored base. So notice how the title is green, so I'm gonna use a green base for the Saw Cleaver Hunter. And next up, you wanna take six health points, one player aid card, and a Hunter deck made out of 12 stack cards, which are three purple vitality cards, three black strength cards, three blue skill cards, and three green endurance cards. You can put this deck next to your Hunter dashboard. Then you can put your six HP tokens in the HP slot, you can put the firearm in the colored active side in the firearm slot, and then you can pick any side of your trick weapon dashboard and put it in this bottom slot here. And that is the hunter setup. Moving on to setup number three, the hunt board. The hunt board acts as your main board. So this is going to be put in the very center of the table. Flip over the intro card and the three chapter setup cards that you can put to the side for now, and take the first chapter card that you're playing with and put it on the chapter slot face up. The mission deck can also go face down and next to it as well. Then notice how your basic stat cards have this symbol at the bottom. This indicates that they are basic stats. So with all the other stat cards without the symbol, shuffle them and make these the upgrade deck. Draw four cards from that, and then place those four cards face up on the four upgrade slots shown here. The rest of the deck can go to the right of those four cards. Then you can shuffle the consumables deck and the rewards deck and put them face down next to the upgrade deck as well. All tokens can be put next to the hunt board, and then take this token to put on the very first space of the hunt track. Now onto the final setup, the chapter setup. So hunters start every chapter on the central lamp, so you can put your hunter mini on any space you want here. Then you want to read the chapter card that you're starting with and see if it lists any special rule cards that are going to be used. Again, since Bloodborne is a campaign game, I don't wanna keep showing you different chapters and what they list. So just double check your chapter card and follow its directions on any special or unique things that are going to be added to that specific chapter. Now the chapter card is also going to tell you which enemies are going to appear. So take the matching enemy cards and randomly pick what side is gonna show up because they do have different attacks and abilities. Shuffle these together and place one enemy on each slot on the hunt board in a random order. You can also take the matching minis listed and set them aside for now, and then shuffle the enemy action deck and place it face down next to the hunt board. Finally, the chapter card is gonna tell you the number of tiles that are going to be used aside from the central lamp. They could be named locations or they could be random tiles. If you see this symbol, it means it's going to tell you a random number depending on how many people you're playing with. So in this case, I'm playing a solo game and I'll just take whatever's listed along with two random ones because two of these symbols times one player is two. And then I'm gonna shuffle them stack them together, and this makes the tile deck. The tile deck is what makes up the map that you're gonna play on. And that is the setup, so let's go ahead and begin the hunt. Now the whole point of Bloodborne is to survive and make sure you are completing missions and side missions before time runs out. So on your turn, you first shuffle the hunter deck and draw three cards. Then in order for you to perform any action, you just discard one of those cards and you can save them so you don't have to use all of them at once. You have five different actions to choose from and we'll go over them one by one, starting first with move. So to move, you discard a stack card. Then you move two spaces on the board in any direction you'd like. Each space is separated by these lines on each tile. And you can move from one adjacent space to another adjacent space. You can move into any space you want, but let's say you wanna go beyond the map and explore an unknown location. 
To do that, you have to be on a space with an exit that's not connected to another tile. And then you reveal a brand new tile card and connect any exit space on the new tile to the one the hunter was on before the move. Since they are now adjacent tiles, it takes one movement point to move from here to here. Now, when the new tile is revealed, you want to populate all the symbols. So in this case, I have a consumable icon that I can put here. And I also have an enemy spawn point, specifically one that has to have this purple claw icon. So I'm gonna take the Scourge Beast in this case and put it on a new space here. And then you have to move to the new tile so it'll take one movement point to move my hunter to the new space right over here. Now this game also has a pursuit mechanism. So if you happen to exit a space or a tile where there was an enemy, then they're gonna run after you and move one space towards you taking the same exact route that you took. So if I moved here to interact with the consumable and then move back towards the central lamp, the Scourge Beast is going to follow me by going to this space here. That's coming from a monster's basic pursuit ability. Scourge Beasts actually have a special ability that lets them move two spaces just as an FYI. Now let's go ahead and backtrack a little bit. When you're on a space that has a consumable, you can discard a stack card, remove the token, and then draw a consumable card in order to interact with that consumable. So now you're starting to notice that the key to all actions here are in your stack cards. You're gonna discard them, perform an action. Discard them, perform another action. They are the basis for the majority of your actions. And when you choose to interact with any part of a space, whether it be for a consumable or some mission cards, they will tell you that you have to interact with the space in order to proceed with the mission. You can also choose to interact with one element, some elements, or all elements. Enemies in Bloodborne also don't just stand around while you go get items right next to them. If you interact on the same space as an enemy, then they're gonna attack you before you complete that interact action. We'll talk all about combat in a little bit, but just know that if you interact while there's an enemy in your space, then you're gonna flip over an enemy action card for each enemy on that space, and you do not get a chance to attack or dodge against them. And if you die during that attack, you do not get to interact at all. Now next up, let's go ahead and go over enemy activation because it does play into combat. So once your turn is over, you want to determine activation range. And to do this, you look at the enemies on the hunter's tile or on tiles connected to it. Those tiles are all within activation range. Any enemies further away cannot detect the hunter's presence and they will not activate. Enemies also activate based on the order of the hunt board going from left to right. If the enemy does activate, then you move that enemy one space towards the hunter unless the enemy is already on the same space as the hunter. If they are on the same space, then the enemy is going to attack. And then you go on to the next enemy and continue the same thing, move and then attack, if they are within range. Now there are two other things to note about enemy activation. One, some situations actually have a surprise movement where hunters who weren't within activation range before now get into range. In that case, enemies will be activated even if it's not a normal opportunity. And if you die before all enemies have a chance to activate, then those enemies no longer activate since their target is now gone from the map. So since interacting involves gaining different items, let's now go ahead and go over consumables, rewards, and firearms. Now consumables are one-time use items that are kept next to your hunter dashboard. They're gonna tell you when they can be used, so like at any time during your hunter turn for instance, or during combat if it says on attack. And then when you use the consumable, you gain the benefit listed right away and then it gets discarded. If the consumables deck is empty, then shuffle the discard pile and form a brand new deck. For rewards, you actually get these from completing missions and they'll also tell you when they can be used. Unlike consumables though, they do not get discarded and instead just get flipped so the text is face down. This is when the reward has been exhausted. You can flip them back up when you go to the Hunter's Dream. And there are two types of rewards. You have Hunter Tools and you have Carol Ruins. Each player can have a maximum of two tools and two ruins. If you have extra, you can give it to another player if you're playing cooperatively or you can also put it to the side as well. You actually keep these awards throughout the entire campaign and between chapters. And lastly are firearms. So just like awards, when you use them, they get exhausted and flipped over to the other side. They still get refreshed, again, by going to the Hunter's Dream, but each firearm will tell you exactly how to refresh it aside from going to the Hunter's Dream as well. Now, it's important to note that you can only have one firearm at a time and you can replace new ones that you get and swap them with old firearms. Just keep the unused ones to the side for now. You can also keep using these throughout the entire campaign and can switch them out between chapters if you want to. Okay, so we've gone over movement, we've gone over interactions, and there are three more actions. The next one is to transform your trick weapon. Now, when you start battling, you're gonna be putting cards into your trick weapon slots and then they're going to eventually fill up. So if you want to clear your trick weapon dashboard and make room for other things or use the ability on the other side, then you can discard a stack card and clear all cards from the board and flip it over to the other side. 
That's it for that one. Now moving on to action number four, and that is to attack. Now here's where the core of the game is. When you want to attack, you have to be on the same space as an enemy, and as you can guess, discard one stack card. But this time, your stack card goes into an empty slot in your trick weapon, which means if you do not have an empty slot, then you're gonna need to transform your trick weapon because if not, you cannot attack. So combat gets initiated when you start an attack or when an enemy initiates it during their enemy activation. On your trick weapon dashboard, you'll see the trick weapon ability at the top and three attack slots for your trick weapon. You have fast with three arrows, medium represented by two arrows, and slow represented by one arrow. Damage is represented by the HP icons. And here's the order for how combat is resolved. So first, you wanna pick a stack card from your hand and put it into an empty attack slot. Every stack card allows a hunter to attack, and they change it in different ways. Endurance is gonna let you dodge enemy attacks, Skills let you stagger an enemy and interrupt their attacks. Strength increases the raw damage of an attack. And Vitality grants defensive options and lets you draw an extra card for the hunter. So once you slot a stack card, you then flip an enemy action card and then you follow what's listed as if it was a basic attack, special attack, or an ability. Now their attacks are just like yours with speed and damage, but if you flip over an ability, those get triggered right away. They are not attacks. Their decks are made up of three basic attacks, two special attacks, and one ability. So eventually you can kind of figure out which enemy card is gonna show up next. Now after you flipped over an enemy action card, next is dodge, where if you have a dodge card in your hand, you can put it in your attack slot, but it has to be the same speed or faster than the enemy's attack. And then lastly, you figure out how attacks are resolved by comparing speed. Faster attacks are of course going to happen first, and if your attack and the enemy's attack is the same, then the attack happens simultaneously. If you take damage, you remove HP tokens equal to the amount that you took, and if you damage an enemy, you put HP tokens near their miniature. If you manage to slay an enemy, then you get to take one blood echo, and that enemy also gets removed from the map. If you end up dying from an attack, you lose all of your blood echoes and you go to the hunter's dream. So that's combat. Let's now go over effects linked to attacks and then bosses and NPC enemies. So if hunters or enemies do not cancel or dodge an attack, then they suffer effects linked to that attack at the same time that they suffer damage from it. The four most common effects are Stagger, where opposing attacks are canceled with a slower speed, and that completely prevents all effects and damage from that attack. For the Stun effect, you have to discard one stack card from your hand, and if you can't, then you take one damage. If you get poisoned, that means you take this token, and at the end of your turn, you take one damage, and you can only have one poison on you at one time. These also get discarded when you go to the Hunter's Dream. And number four is Frenzy, where you take this token, and then you suffer one additional damage from all attacks. But just like Poison, you can only have one Frenzy token at a time and also gets discarded when you go to the Hunter's Dream. Now switching on over to bosses, I'm gonna show you one boss just to show you how they work. So again, just a quick spoiler disclaimer. So bosses spawn from mission cards and they have their own boss HP card that are double-sided. Those cards show two phases and there are also two unique boss action decks. So when a boss is spawned, you're gonna take its mini and put it on the requested space from the mission card. You then take its boss HP card and both boss action decks to put next to the hunt board. Each boss is gonna scale with the number of hunters playing and they start off on the phase one side. Now once it takes all the damage listed, remove the HP tokens and flip it to phase two. And even if your damage exceeds phase one health, that damage does not carry on over to the phase two side. Now the boss action deck is similar to the enemy action deck. So every time the boss attacks, you flip the top card over depending on the phase. And then each one has a different attack that you perform with the same exact combat mechanics. Now sometimes mission cards are gonna tell you to place an NPC character on a map. These NPCs can sometimes be enemies for you. And if you encounter an NPC enemy, you wanna take the enemy card and put it next to the hunt board. They are represented by tokens, so NPCs function the same as regular enemies. But the only difference is that the enemy card only has one distinct side instead of two sides. One side is for one to two players, and the other side is for three to four players. So we have move, interact, transform trick weapon, attack, and the last action that you can perform is to go to the hunter's dream. So in Bloodborne, death is only a mild inconvenience. So when you discard a stack card and then choose to go to the hunter's dream on your own, or if you die and get sent there, here's what happens. First, you have the hunt track that moves up one space. And if you land on this red space called the reset point, think of it as like the blood moon where things are gonna go crazy. So all non-boss enemies are removed from the map. All consumables get replenished. All enemies related to missions get respawned. And then all spawn points also get respawned with monsters. And if you're fighting a boss, they also get fully healed. So remove all their damage tokens as well. Okay, so we're still at the hunter's dream where we advance one space on the hunt track. 
Then you want to combine all your stack cards from your hand, from your discard pile, and from your trick weapon as well. Put these together as one deck, and then all your Blood Echoes will get discarded, and then you get to pick upgrades based on how many of those Blood Echoes that you did discard. So if I had two Blood Echoes, I can choose one upgrade, and then the deck refills that slot, and then I can choose another upgrade, and then again, the deck fills up that slot as well. For each upgrade, you can pick whether or not to incorporate them into your deck. You always have to have 12 cards, so discard cards for each new card that you want to mix into your deck. Whichever upgrades are not incorporated, these get discarded permanently for the whole chapter. And then you shuffle the Hunter deck, refresh your Firearm, your Reward cards also get refreshed, and then you also want to discard any status tokens like Poison and Frenzy, and finally, fully heal yourself up to 6 HP. At the start of your next round, you refill your hand with 3 stack cards as usual, then you can pick the side that you want to start with for your Trick Weapon, and then place your Mini on the Lamp again. Okay, so there are two final things to go over. The first one is Intelligent and Cruel. If you happen to run into an instance where the game gives you a choice in resolving different actions, you always want to go with the worst possible outcome. Why? Because Yarnum is cruel, and also merciless, so that's what happens to us hunters. Second thing is with Fog Gates. Sometimes the mission card is going to tell you to surround a tile with Fog Gates. These are special tokens that isolate a tile from the rest of the map. Now all you do for these is to put tokens on each exit, and if you're on a lamp tile, then you put a broken lamp symbol in order to replace that lamp. Now a couple things happen when a tile is surrounded by fog. You can enter a tile with fog, but you can never leave unless you go to the Hunter's Dream. Now lamps covered with a broken lamp symbol can never be used as a respawn point for hunters that are returning from the Hunter's Dream. Enemies also can't enter or exit a tile with fog gates, and if they are pursuing you, they stop in the space adjacent to that tile. Enemies that aren't listed on that mission card also don't spawn on that tile while fog gates are active as well. The only way you can get rid of fog is if the mission that created them is complete, and when it is removed, then you also remove the broken lamp symbol as well. From there, enemies will spawn as usual on that tile going on to the next blood moon. And that is how you play Bloodborne. So first, you want to check to see what your mission says or what your inside cards say. Your inside cards are your side quests. And then you start off by drawing three stack cards every single turn. And then you want to discard those cards one by one in order to move up to two spaces, interact with missions, or gain a consumable. Or you can battle a monster in order to gain blood echoes. And then you discard cards in order to transform your weapon if your slots become full. And lastly, for the fifth possible action, you can discard a card in order to visit the Hunter's Dream. This acts kind of like a reset point. So you use those blood echoes that you gain from defeating monsters in order to purchase upgrades. And you can also reset your trick weapon, recover from status effects, and advance the hunt. After you finish there, your hunter respawns at the lamp in order to continue your mission. And that's basically how the game works. So if you are successful in completing a chapter, all hunters will go to the hunter's dream and gain upgrade cards with your remaining blood echoes. If you don't want to go on to the next chapter right away, you can save your progress by storing all your firearms, your consumables, and all your wards all together with your Hunter's deck. Now you also want to make sure that you store any completed inside cards and any upgrade cards that were discarded and go back into the deck. If you don't want to save your progress and continue straight, then you do kind of the same thing, you just don't combine everything. So keep your own upgrade cards, keep your consumables, your firearms, your reward cards, your inside cards, and then just take the next chapter and follow the setup that's listed there. And that is how you play Bloodborne. We hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Thank you so much for joining us here, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck, hunters.